for a subject for our meditation day, the parable of the prodigal son. It is well known to each of you, but I wonder whether there are not aspects which are worth underlying year after year as we discover more and more the depths of Christ's parables. A parable is a strange way of conveying the truth. It is a story which is direct, which stands in all right, is most of the time uncomplicated. But as we change inwardly, we hear it in ever new ways. And so, having reflected on this parable for many a year, I would like to share with you something that has come to me in the course of these decades. I'm not going to read aloud the text, which is certainly well known to you, but just a few passages. There was once a man who had two sons, and the younger said to his father, Father, give me my share of the property. So he divided his share between them, and a few days later, the young man turned the whole of his share into cash and left home for a distant country. The story sounds so smooth, so simple, but if we reflect on what it implies, it is so frighteningly sinister. Here is a young man who was brought up in a happy family. He had a father, he had a mother, he had a brother, about whom I will say something later. He was surrounded by retainers, by servants, by friends. And until he discovered that there was a world outside, a glamorous world, a world that was attractive, that was so different from the smooth, peaceful life he had led, he was happy there. He was part of his family. And the news came to him gradually through visiting people, through hearsay of this world outside of their village or their cottage. And he could not resist the temptation. All that had been a happiness before became stale. It lost its attraction. It lost its beauty. In a way, it lost its meaning for him. And he decided to go into the wide world to become part of the world so vast, so alluring, so completely unknown to him, and therefore so attractive. He did not say to his father that he was tempted to see new things. With the crudeness, the cruelty of the young, of certain of the young, he turned to his father, and if I may paraphrase their conversation, he said to him, Father, I am young. I am full of sap. I have everything ahead of me. I cannot wait. I cannot wait until you are dead to be free. So let us make an agreement. Let us agree that as far as I'm concerned, you are dead from now on. 
you will divide between my brother and yourself and me all the money you have and you'll give me my share. And then, as far as I'm concerned, you will be dead and I will be alive. Alive with a new life of which I have never had any notion. And I'll leave you forever. This is how it sounds to me. This is how I think it must have sounded to the Father. I cannot wait until you die. Let us agree that you are dead now. And the Father did not say one word of protest. Not one word. He did not try to dissuade the boy. He not, did not try to point out to the fact that this was murder the boy was committed in his soul and heart and will. Without a word, he divided his wealth and gave to this boy what would be his when he would have actually died. What strikes me is the way in which the father said not one word of reproach, did not try to dissuade him from the tune of the voice, from the crudeness of the request, it was clear that no word would ever reach this boy. And he accepts to be killed, to die. This is perhaps one of the most tragic aspects of love. The desire, the readiness, if need be, to die, no longer to be, no longer to exist if one is not wanted or, on the contrary, if one is desperately needed and if only your death can save another person. The second aspect of love that coincides with death, we find in the Incarnation. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that the world may be saved. And the Son accepted to become man, to share with us the tragedy of the fallen world, he accepted to share with us our mortality. He accepted to die our death because this was the limit and the perfection of his love to us. He could give nothing more. He gave his life. And in a sense, the father whom we are speaking did the same. Because it is not money he gave to his son. He accepted not to exist anymore for him. He accepted of his free will to die that the other one may live the way he chose. And the boy turned away and left. He dropped off his shoulders the robe he had worn as a member of the family 
He had no use for it. He appeared like a popinjay in what he thought were city clothes and went away. It doesn't appear that he even turned around to say with his eyes at least a last farewell to the home he was rejecting and leaving to the people who stood by the door hoping that he will at least turn around and wave to them he just went away this was a young man who wanted to have a new life but it applies so much to each and all of us because we accept from God we receive from God indeed we claim from God all and everything he gave us life he gave us a body he gave us a soul he gave us a mind he gave us a feeling heart he filled our lives with all that makes it deep and rich and precious but what happens to it all all that we receive but we do not bring it back to him as we say in the words of the liturgy bring him before thee thine of thine own we take it and we take it and use it according to our own devices we lead the life we choose we allow our minds to be filled with things that are alien to God so do we with our hearts our life is not the life of people whose only or at least main purpose is to be on earth what God has willed us to be and when I say willed I do not mean forced upon us but knowing what was good opened it to us the will of God is our freedom but what do we do with this freedom we confuse the word and the thought and the thing in so many ways the word freedom has got so many shades of meaning I would like to dwell one moment on it the Latin word libertas is a condition of a child born free in a family of free people it's a condition of one who is determined by no other power he can determine his destiny and his life it's so different from what we find in modern days in a word in words like liberty liberation which means being and doing what i choose irrespective of anything then there is a russian word for freedom 
which is svaboda, which according to one possible etymology means to be truly one's own self. And then there is another nuance to it which I find particularly moving and beautiful. The English word freedom, the German word Freiheit, come from the Sanskrit, a word which means, which is priya, and which means to love and to be loved. So that is what freedom is. To be born with the right to be oneself. And to be born with this right because one is loved totally, absolutely, unreservedly, at any cost to God. And the whole gospel reveals us what divine love is. And we use it so often in the way in which this boy, blind, unevolved, lacking of understanding, selfish, used his freedom, his right to dispose of himself as he chose. And we can see him walk away without looking over his shoulder at what he leaves. Because what he leaves means nothing anymore to him. Everything is open to him. The wide world, the unknown world, all the glories he imagines, all the glories of which he heard somehow. The past is dead, but the Father has chosen, like God, to accept, to be murdered, to accept to die, rather than enslave this son of his, this boy. I want not to dwell a little on another person in the household, the older son. We find him at the very end of the parable. And somehow we see in him only negative sides. We see in him a cold, dutiful young man who has toil toiled all his life without receiving and then even without expecting any kind of reward. But there is more to him. He is an older brother. To begin with, he was probably the beloved little boy, the firstborn that was the pride and the joy of his mother, of his father, or the retainers, or the servants, or the friends. He was surrounded by love and concern and interest. And then something happened that happens often in families. Another child was born. And the interest that had been his exclusively was removed from him and was given to the newborn child. 
and he was left to grow. And he was told probably so often it happens that now he was a big boy. He had responsibilities. He had duties. That the little one needed concern and help and tenderness that he must know that and make room and then as he was growing he was given more responsibilities more jobs more things to do and gradually what was left to him is to be a dutiful active intelligent devoted son what he still wanted to play what he still longed for the tenderness and the love and the concern that had been his until it had been stolen by the newborn baby and the growing child. And he was good. He obviously did not hate his brother. He obviously did not resent his position, he only knew that what that was his place in life. He worked, he did all that was expected of him, he became, as it happens often, a grown up while he was still a youth. But one day, something happened that was too much for him, incomprehensible. This boy who had supplanted him, that had made him irrelevant in so many ways, suddenly decided to go to be happy. He also had hoped for happiness, although he had not longed for the kind of happiness this younger boy has chosen. He saw him dress up, acquire new manners, become an alien in this family of simple, healthy, wholesome, women and men, and then leave. Leave having told his father that he is too impatient to wait for the father to die, that he wanted to go now, even if it meant that the father did no longer exist for him, neither the family, nor the friends, nor anyone. He saw that. We can imagine pain, a complex pain. He saw that this boy was moving to some sort of happiness of which he perhaps had dreamt himself, not in the form in which the boy had chosen to live it, but something that was less pressing, less heavy, less constraining than the life of the farm, and that he was allowed to go without a word of reproach. And he, because he was older, because he now had responsibilities, because the father could count on him now more than ever, because the younger one had gone, he had to stay. Perhaps did you think at that moment that there was no future for him, that his future was enslavement, imprisonment, 
a life limited on all sides, endlessly monotonous. And he lived with that day after day, seeing his life in the context of what he imagined his younger brother's life was freedom, joy, friends, lack of responsibility, not being tied, chained to work. He probably thought more than once about it, but he accepted his destiny because he had been taught and had imbibed a sense of responsibility. And then one day his younger brother came. He had left, decked up in clothes that he thought was the clothes of the city. And he came back in rags. And he, together with the other members of the farm, saw him from a distance. And they saw the father, who probably had gone out time and again in the hope that his son would one day come back. They saw the father rush towards him, embrace him, bring him home. Home. to the place which he had renounced, for which he had no heart. I will come back to this passage, but can you imagine what this young man felt? The universal joy at the return of the prodigal son or the wanderer who had betrayed all the love and care of the family and the farm and was now received in glory as though it was he was the most precious gift they could receive from heaven. And he was bitter. He had not apparently been bitter before. He had been dutiful, a prisoner of life. But now he was bitter. And when his father commanded the fattened calf to be slaughtered for a great feast to be had in honor of the return of this boy, he refused to come. That was injustice. That was too cruel on him. That he could not accept. That this boy who had chosen to renounce them all should be received as a most precious guest. What about him? He had been faithful. Faithful without failing. All these years, one, two, three years, what does it matter? It seemed to be an eternity when all that might have been shared between the father and the two sons fell on his shoulders as the father was growing older 
and his younger brother had run away to go and rejoice in his return he could not face and he refused to come and the father came to him and pleaded for his return and the young man said to him look I have worked all my life for you and you have never given me even a goat a sheep to rejoice with my friends and now this son of yours he doesn't even call him my brother this son of yours because he has nothing to do with him who has spent all his part of the inheritance with harlots and loose living is back you make of it a feast for the whole family for the whole household not one retainer not one worker in, on the farm will miss it and you never did this thing for me and the father said to him my son you are always with me all that is mine is thine but this the young man had never understood yes everything was his because it was the father's and the father had no hesitation sharing in giving everything but what he had experienced was hard work in a hard working family he had not realized that everything else was his also the warmth the companionship the tenderness the love the fun everything that way made their common life into life all that was there his and the father said something of which he had never thought you were always with me but this brother of yours had died and he's risen again he had not died physically obviously but what he had died in his soul love had died in him nothing was left except greed nothing and this greed of his had brought about its punishment to begin with he had been feted and then when he was a pauper rejected it was his turn to know what dying means but in a way in which which was so different from the fathers the father died willingly by giving his life the boy died out because he was rejected there was no one who needed him who wanted him whether he lived or died was no one's concern and he had come back to the place where he had 
yes, committed a murder because he felt that his, if his father had loved him in such a way, to such an extent, there was hope for him. The older son discovered two dimensions in love and in death. We are not told of what happened. But from we know, what we know of him, we may hope that looking at his father, hearing his words, he thought, yes, if I want to be my father's son, I must be my brother's brother. I have not given my life for him, but I must now give something of my life for his sake, accept him, trying to bring back this youth whose soul has died and who has been reminded of life and of death through the misery of his body, from the reject rejection he had undergone. We can hope that he came, that he probably found it difficult to embrace his brother, but perhaps did his brother make it possible or easier for him? Because he came back not only broken, but broken-hearted, aware of what he had been and what he still was, unworthy of love, of his father, of his family, of his brother also. When the elder brother saw him broken and yet alive with hope and resurrected by repentance, broken-heartedness, he may have looked at him and discovered something about compassion. And compassion might have helped him to accept this brother of his. I will end this in first talk at this point and leave you to reflect on what I have said and to see how it applies to your own experience of life, of selfishness, of greed, of love, of compassion. And this afternoon in my second talk, I'll come to the prodigal son himself. <laughs>